I often find myself reflecting upon the fascinating story of human evolution. It's a story of an upright ape that transcended from his primitive existence in the brutal habitat of the African savanna to become the most sophisticated creature capable of building tribes, civilizations, and empires that took over the planet. One of the most essential reasons for this was that the human being became a storytelling creature, an organism that relies on its ability to tell each other stories to survive. We are the only creature on earth that tells each other stories from the minute we wake up to the minute we go to sleep. Stories not only entertain us, they comfort us when we have lost, let's say, a loved one. They can educate us, train us to become better at survival, and help us make sense of the world around us. Through stories, we learned how to hunt, how to light fire, how to maintain the broader health of our tribe. In order to tell better stories, creativity became a critical apparatus for human existence. Through creativity came the idea of expression, art, and innovation that led to the development of civilizations that we know of today. I want to talk a little bit about this expression. Over time, what develops is something called a grand narrative, which is an amalgamation of a series of stories. The best way to put it is that these grand narratives are broader storylines that we rely on to define ourselves. When we talk about ourselves, where do we begin? We are from a certain family, a family whose grand narrative is constructed on the stories of its past, parents, grandparents, and so on, that we use other grand narratives to define us, like religion, tribes, and nation states. They become ways to define a level of kinship with one another. These grand narratives become our identity. The key point of my argument is that because all grand narratives are built on storylines, they must stand against the forever evolving nature of our existence. Like all ideas, grand narratives should be questioned and put to the test. If an idea is strong enough to withhold a counter-argument, it shall survive. If not, it will fail. It's as simple as that. So how do these stories come about in the first place? To understand this, we must take a look at where all stories are born with a simple idea. Therefore, to begin developing any kind of story, one must be able to think freely. There's nothing in this world more fascinating than the human imagination, and the imagination must be allowed to do its thing. Think about a film you once saw, or a painting that moved you, made you sit back in awe of its beauty. Think of all the brilliant inventions that we have at our disposal today, from the airplane to the rocket ship. Everything, everything began with a dream. By our very nature, human beings are meant to dream. We are meant to create. Therefore, it's essential that we strive to maintain the only true freedom we have, the freedom of expression. All other freedoms are built upon that astounding idea, that fundamental truth that the human mind is a beautiful mechanism which has evolved to dream and should never be constrained. The restriction of this freedom of expression, I believe, is detrimental not only to society, but to the human race. What happens when an idea is different from another? What happens if one tribe's story is offensive to another tribe? The answer? Nothing. Stories are just intangible devices that enable us to see different points of view. That's it. If you don't like a story, don't read it. I find myself reflecting on this lately, more and more in the age that we're in. It's become normal to try and silence the ideas we don't agree with. Journalists are told what they can and cannot write about. Governments and political leaders are constantly banning, censoring books and invading art galleries. We have begun to cancel each other on social media simply because we don't agree with each other. Because why not? Isn't it just easy to shut out an idea that differs from our own than to listen to it? Wouldn't it just be easier to ban a notion than to weigh its merits against our own polemic? Why? It's because we're afraid. We're afraid of being offended. 
We're afraid that some ideas just might happen to be better than our own. And this fear is leading us into a very dangerous and unforgiving place. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Let's explore what happens when you try and restrict this human expression. When you ban a book, or in my case, are too afraid to put it on the bookshelves, you're not just taking away someone's basic human right to speak and to share their words and narratives, you're also stifling a story that could have given birth to other narratives, other lines of inquiry and thinking. Same goes for film, theater, and other art forms. But all these restrictions, all these intolerances, always boil down to one simple thing, balance of power. Those who have power versus those who don't. Those who have the power of the grand narrative will always try and silence opposing views. This goes for any kind of power dynamic, men over women, rich over poor, one race over another, or even autocratic dictatorships over free societies. Think of something that you're not allowed to do right now, but would be in a free society. Believe me, behind it is an entity who doesn't want to lose their power to restrict you. In certain societies where women don't have equal rights, it's because the men of that society don't want to relinquish their power. Think about societies that live under dictatorships. The dictators control the grand narrative in order to maintain the power over their people. Here's something even more riveting in this power struggle. More and more, what ends up happening is that the art form survives and lives longer than the people who try to restrict it. One great example from this city that we're in right now is the works of Sadat Hasan Manto, who quite possibly is the greatest short form story writer to have emerged from this part of the world. Manto, in both pre and post British occupation, was taken to trial for a total of six times for the crime of obscenity. Think about that for a moment. Obscenity. The definitions of that word have changed so many times since Manto was alive. The people that wanted Manto's work to be silenced, banned or cancelled are all gone. But what remains are his wonderful short stories that are now looked at with immense fondness and are treated as an insight into our history. In this sense, the art had not only outlived the artist, but those who tried to eliminate it. A very recent example is that of the great artist Emma Hussain, who was driven out of his country by Hindu nationalist mobs that claimed that Hussain's depiction of Hindu goddesses were, to use the word again, obscene. Emma Hussain sadly spent the last years of his life in exile and died. But his paintings, fortunately, live on and will continue to live on for many, many years to come. But the irony is that we come from an ancient culture that was built on the very idea of freedom of expression, freedom of speech. There are wonderful ancient traditions that speak of freedom of expression that come from this land that we are in right now. There's so many stories of Sufi poets who defied the norms of their times and wrote such inspirational poems that are relevant even today. But the greatest example of this is the Natya Shastra, the myth that revolves around the story of ancient gods Indra and Brahma who summon the people of the land to put on a show for them and the demons. The people in their creative expression decided to put on a play which reenacted the battle scene where Indra defeats the demons. But the play is performed, and according to the myth, the demons become so offended, they try and attack the actors on stage. In response, Brahma and Indra guard the four corners of the stage and declare that within these corners of the stage, the people are free to express themselves in any way they feel, and nobody should ever harm them. The story resulted in the magnificent storytelling culture that we inherit in the subcontinent today. The wonderful depictions of paintings, statues, and brilliant architecture that can still be found. It's also the symbol of the realization that freedom of expression is paramount above all, and these expressions, however absurd they may be, they should be allowed to exist in an open society. That is to say, within the four corners of this theatrical realm, anything goes. So, 
It's important to realize the truth that when you start silencing one voice, you end up in a society where no one is allowed to say anything. And eventually, those societies end up suffering from the prejudices that they keep. But if you want to live in a tolerant society, a society luxuriously steeped in the rich abundance of culture, begin by asking yourself these basic questions, these grand narratives that I've been told, that I so dearly believe in, can they be questioned? Are there better ideas out there? Am I restricted to think and create freely? If the answers to any of those questions is yes, then please embark on the journey to tell your own story. Express yourself without fear of persecution, because some stories are too powerful to be kept silent. Creativity is the only way we survived before, and it's the only way we will survive in the future. The stifling of this very basic liberty is to strip us from the most important thing that makes us human. The imagination is a very, very powerful thing. All you've got to do is simply set it free.